Good morning. Some of you may have noticed that we have an important visitor with us this morning. He's sitting in the back pew. I think he's really believing the Holy Spirit hovers back there. But we're happy to see that Tom Moody is up and getting around and dancing and it's good to have you back. Tom, you'll be happy to know that we brought out the big guns for you today. Dr. Matthew McCurry played organ for us last week and is playing again. He did a wonderful job, and I know all of us are looking forward to that, and we're grateful for you being here. It's Pentecost Sunday, and it seems an appropriate time for us to all be together. But there are a few announcements that I need to share with you. First of all, we'd like to welcome additionally another guest with us, Reverend Ken Dick, who recently is the retired coordinating presbyter of our Presbytery of Western Kentucky. Ken has been there since 2014, I think he told me, and he said he started out as an interim and they just never asked him to leave. <laughs> I've determined that being the presbyter of a presbytery is probably a lot like herding cats. Us Presbyterians can be obstinate at times, but he's done a fabulous job and we're grateful for him being here this morning with us. In addition, today's special because Vacation Bible School starts and I know you'll want to be there. There's all kinds of food trucks that will be showing up over at the Episcopal Church where we're participating with them in this and it's not just for the kids. Uh, feel free to get over there. It's about 4.30 or so, I think, it starts. And show up and lend your support and say hi. And if you want to participate in the crafts and games, I bet you they can find a place for you too, no matter how old you might be. In addition, there is an event today that has nothing to do with church, but has something to do with our wonderful city and that is the Fairy Garden Tour. Number one on that spot is the home of the Raybolds, and you will see the renovated gardens of Mrs. Ruth Raybold, and the Raybolds have done a fabulous job in putting that all together. But all of the proceeds from that go towards Lost River Cave, and specifically to replace the trees that they lost during our recent tornado. I know all of us miss the trees, and that's a worthy cause. So I would encourage you to think about that and make a stop. In addition, let me bring you greetings from your nominating committee, the members of which are Bobby Raybold, John Kernahan, Kim Ferguson, Annette Parkinson, Pamela Bratcher, Joe McFarlane, Brianna Tricky, Eddie Solberg-Hale, and me. We've worked hard to gather nominees together to serve in the next class of elders and deacons and we believe we have an excellent class of elders and deacons lined up. For Elder, Buzz English, Pamela Napier, Carol Ahmed, Julia Link Roberts, and Julia Wedge. Our deacon class is equally distinguished. Fred Tricky, Ernie Small, Dan Stelling, Terry Polin, and we have Kathy Higgins who has said she would join us for an uncompleted term of one year uh, for a deacon who had to step away. On June 26, we will have a congregational meeting to elect these and perhaps some others. But there's a rub. We need more deacons. We have several spots like Kathy Higgins is filling for one year and a few for two year terms. And frankly, we need more to round out our next class. Ideally, each class would have seven deacons. Now you might say, Tim, I've been there and done that, but your church needs you. I recently learned that four young women graduating from West Point had been named Rhodes Scholars. As is the custom of such prestigious honors, they were asked for advice for others. And one young woman said, you don't stop when you reach the finish line. I would encourage all of us to echo her statement and step up in service. You can see any of the nominating committee members to suggest a name or even to volunteer. And finally, before we begin our worship this morning, we want to recognize some important people who are members of our church. 
those young people who are wearing the uniform and are in service to us, Michael Spencer, Matthew Spencer, Jack Grice, please remember each of those people in your time of prayer daily. And it does not seem right that we let another week begin without remembering all of those who served us and gave their lives for us so that we can enjoy the freedom to assemble here to worship our Lord. This past Monday was Memorial Day, and it is a day set aside to remember those who served us and gave the last full measure for our freedom. It seems somewhat fitting on Pentecost to mention this. Our Lord gave his life for us that we might have everlasting freedom, and each of us are blessed by our Lord to be citizens of this country, and we bear a special responsibility to share his good news because of our freedom. So will you stand and join in singing hymn number 338, O oh, Beautiful for Spacious Skies.
we rise in spirit and in body. Join me in the call to worship. Come to Jesus, you who are thirsty. Alleluia. Drink deeply of the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Let your heart overflow with the living water that renews the face of the earth. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. join me this morning in the reading of the prayer of adoration and confession. God of new creation, we confess that we have failed to trust your bountiful goodness. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you brought forth the earth and its creatures in abundance. Yet we refuse to share your gifts. We dishonor your generosity by withholding our charity to those in need. We betray, we betray your kindness, your kindness by dealing, dealing harshly with, with our enemies. enemies. We, we disregard, disregard your, your compassion by judging the sins of others. others. Forgive us. By the by power, power of your spirit, spirit renew our, our hearts and, and free us from, from sins, sins that, that we, we may enjoy the fullness of your, your blessings, blessings upon all things. Amen. We have received a great news. By the promises of God demonstrated in Christ, we know we are forgiven. Amen. Now let us greet one another with a word of peace. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.
Let us pray. Lord, open our minds and hearts today that we may receive your word. In the name of your Son, amen. The first reading is responsive. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crown gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs in our own language. We hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judah and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved.
amen. Good morning. Indeed, on this first Sunday of retirement, it is good to be with you. For this is where it all began for me many years ago. I came to Bowling Green May of 1975 as a recent seminary graduate. And you took me in, you sponsored me in the process of ordination. And I have not forgotten that even these many years later. Your kindness, your generosity, and your guidance to me. Indeed, you are a very special church to me and to this presbytery. And I give thanks that in many ways you show the church at its best. Thank you for who you are. For the scripture reading of the gospel this morning, I'd like to, on this Pentecost Sunday, backtrack just a little bit and return to a scripture that is usually looked at at an earlier time in the church year, but one I believe speaks to us on this Pentecost Sunday. Please stand with me as we read the gospel. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the servant called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves a good wine first and then the inferior wine when the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. <clears throat> A little boy is sitting at the dinner table with his family when his father says to him, son, would you like to say the blessing for our food? Looking over the table, the little boy says, okay, and everyone bows their head. He prays, dear Jesus, I heard in Sunday school this morning that you turned water into wine. So could you also do something with this broccoli? Amen. Now, I can in some ways identify with the little boy in that not being a native southerner, I have wondered at times at certain food items that have been placed before me on the dining room table. But that's not what Jesus had in mind when he performed his first sign at a wedding in Cana of Galilee, a sign that confirmed his identity and looked forward to what God can and will do. For to change water into wine at a wedding ceremony is a reminder to us that God brings joy to our lives. For a Middle Eastern wedding is an occasion in which a sacred vow is performed not only between two individuals, but also their families and close friends in a joyful celebration 
that can last up to seven days. And as the best wine is essential to make that celebration complete, the bridegroom is responsible to make sure that everyone else has all they need so that they can leave the celebration with joyful hearts. But celebrating in many ways can be very fleeting in our own lives. In fact, I have heard from time to time preachers say that because scripture never indicates that Jesus laughed, we must always be serious, sober-minded, and even mournful. And as we, of course, look at the state of our lives from time to time and the ongoing condition of our world, there is a time and place for such things. Indeed, as Jesus himself knew what was going to happen, that his time would come to suffer we also at times can be weighed down by the stresses, by the grief, by the struggles, by the disappointments of our lives. And also our hearts can be troubled by the ongoing violence and the conflict in the world in which we live. But on an occasion, when the Israelites returned from exile, and they were rebuilding their lives in the land of their ancestors. We're told that as they listened to the words of the law, they were told this. This day is holy to the Lord our God. Do not mourn or weep. Go your way. Eat the fat, drink sweet wine, and send portions to those for whom nothing has been prepared. For this day is holy to the Lord. Do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. It is the joy of the Lord, we're told. The joy that God brings. That indeed is the strength of our lives. And the lives of the issues that we face. And so just as celebrating at a wedding in Galilee, Galilee, as we come together for worship, as we trust in a God whose promises, whose presence, whose care is faithful and true, we can have a sense of peace within, a joyful feeling of what it means to be God's people together. It's why we light a candle of joy on the third Sunday in Advent. And a few days later, we will sing joy to the world, the Lord has come. It is why scripture tells us that Jesus and the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And it is why when the Israelites returned from captivity, we're told that they said our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with joy. Indeed, it is that joy together, regardless of the circumstances of life that brings, as we trust in the goodness of our God that makes us joyful people and makes worship together another opportunity to share the joy of God with one another in worship. But changing water into wine, is also a reminder to us that we serve a God of abundance. For six stone water jars for the Jewish rite of purification, holding 20 or 30 gallons each was much more than those at that wedding ceremony could consume. And Jesus could have just used one or two of them and for the same purpose, that the steward would then say to the bridegroom, everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine when the guests are drunk, but you have saved the good wine until now. An act of abundance. Jesus provides more than we can imagine, and more than those wedding guests could imagine. But often we struggle with that and truly appreciating what it means for God 
to be a God of abundance. And that's especially seen in our churches today. For recent studies indicate that the percentage of Americans who claim to be Christian has dropped 12% during the last decade. And the percentage of individuals who indicate they worship monthly or more often has decreased from 54% to 45%. And if that's not alarming, we're also told that in the same decade, the percentage of those who identify as religiously unaffiliated has increased from 17% to 26%, more than a quarter of the population. And those who are claiming nothing in particular now account for 17% of the population. Those can be grim statistics to hear. In many ways, because of that, it is said that the result of this decline has made many churches in our country spend their time, their resources, and their efforts just in seeking to stave off institutional death. So what can we do? How can we respond? We can certainly give in to the mindset of scarcity. The idea that there is never enough and we compete with each other for limited resources. We can give into that mindset and see ourselves as God's people simply competing with the churches around us for limited membership and resources. Or we can reaffirm the abundance of God's love and grace. An abundance greater than we can even perceive that motivates us to respond with the riches of care and compassion as our mission to those in need. And though that might not always bring people immediately into our pews, it is a vision, a vision of the abundance of our God that is reflective of what the Apostle Paul says when he says, now unto him who by the power within us is able to do exceeding abundantly more than we ask or think. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus from generation to generation forever and ever. Being realistic about our situation is not the same as giving up on what God is able to do. And hopefully as we gather for worship, it is not to give in to a spirit of scarcity but it is to affirm the abundance of our God that is greater than we can imagine. But the central meaning behind changing water into wine is that God is in the business of something new and invites us to join in that effort you know, the prophet Isaiah many years earlier said, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The prophet there was seeing as something new, the return of those exiles, but also as he goes on to describe a suffering servant, the ultimate something new that God would bring, 
in a surprising way to bring reconciliation to this creation. But do we hear that word of something new in our own lives as well? For a recent bell-shaped curve that describes the life cycle of a church caught my attention because it identifies as the first step in the downward cycle toward institutional death is what it calls a preoccupation with nostalgia, which is basically comparing things today with some time in the past. And because of our anxiety about the uncertainty of the future, we wish to return to the good old days when things must have been better back then. Yes, it is essential for us to celebrate our heritage, as you have done in celebrating just a little while ago 200 years as a congregation. But maybe God wants us instead of looking to the past. Maybe God wants to take the water of our life together, which has been impacted by more than two years of a global pandemic, and maybe to transform it into something new, a willingness on our part to discern and to seek new ways to proclaim the message of an unchanging God to that changing culture in which we live. But are we truly transformed on this day of Pentecost? For as told about the old recluse who lived high in the mountains deep in Colorado. And when he died, distant relatives from the city came to claim his valuables. When they arrived, all they saw was an old sh shack and an outhouse next to it. Inside the shack, there was an old cooking pot and his mining equipment sitting next to it. A cracked table with a three-legged chair sat next to a tiny window with a kerosene lamp as the centerpiece for the table. In a dark corner, there was a dilapidated cot with a threadbare be bedroll on it. The relatives picked up a few of the relics and began to leave. But they were flagged by an old friend of the recluse on his mule who asked them, do you mind if I get whatever is left of my friend from the cabin? Sure, they said. You go for it, since they thought nothing of value would remain. Well, the old friend entered the shack and went immediately to the table Bending down, he lifted up the floorboard and proceeded to take out all the gold that the recluse had discovered over 53 years, enough to build a palace. The recluse had died with only his friend knowing his true worth. Looking out the window, as he saw the dust begin to rise behind the relatives' cars as they were leaving, he said to himself, they should have gotten to know him better. So what does this have to do with Pentecost? Indeed, it is the challenge for us today. For as Jesus turned water into wine, he proclaimed the joy, the abundance, the new creation that our God brings. And through the fire of the Spirit on that day of Pentecost, 
that became a reality to all those who received it. Indeed, just as those first disciples were told, as they witnessed his glory, they believed in him. Or more literally, they put their trust in him. May we, on this Pentecost Sunday, may we allow that spirit once again to empower us with the strength of the joy and the abundance and the new creation that God can provide. Maybe we are here today because we are focusing on outward scarcity or focusing on the allure of the past. But maybe we are here indeed because of that one who gave himself that we might enjoy the riches of God's mercy and grace now and always. May that be our prayer. May that be what we look forward to as God's people, that the spirit of Pentecost, the spirit of joy, the spirit of abundance, and the spirit of a new creation would be ours, that would empower us to share that message to a desperately needing world for God's love and God's grace, the new wine that God provides. Join with me in prayer. God of the future, so often we find ourselves caught in the past, struggling with notions of scarcity, and what it means to deal with the struggles of life before us. Remind us on this day of Pentecost, as Jesus turned water into wine, brought that new wine of your creation. Indeed, as a spirit empowered people with joy, with abundance, and with that new creation to live out that story of what it means to trust in you and what you are able and willing to do. Empower us once again, strengthen our lives that we might be those witnesses in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The affirmation of faith is printed in the order of worship. 
let us say what we believe. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Speak of Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his glory. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Speak of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit's blessing of the Church. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Discipleship to Christ requires our very best. Let us come before God with our tithes and our offerings. Loving God, we give you these gifts out of the many blessings you have given us. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Join with me in prayer. Almighty God, at the Feast of Pentecost, 
you sent your Holy Spirit to indwell the disciples, filling them with joy and boldness to preach the gospel. Empower us with that same spirit to witness to your redeeming love and draw all people to you through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. People will come from north and south and from east and west to sit at table in the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's table. It does not belong to me or to the session of this church. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share in the feast that he has prepared. When our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Join with me in prayer. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God, creator and ruler of the universe. With the majesty of your hand, you shape this world and all that is in it. By your Holy Spirit, you breathe life into human form and set us on earth to praise and serve you. When we wandered from your ways and were lost in sin's wilderness, your truth burned in the hearts of prophets who called your people to return to the path of righteousness. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son to be our deliverer. In every age, your Holy Spirit has led us in your way. We give you thanks that the Lord Jesus on the night before he died took bread and having given thanks he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying take eat this is my body given for you this do in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup of the new covenant, saying, This is the covenant that is sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Wherever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and cup. We joyfully celebrate his dying and rising, and we wait for the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. Come to me and never be hungry. Believe in me and never be thirsty. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You are invited to partake.
We come to that time that is the prayers for the people. Before I begin, there is another person that all of us are happy to see back in our worship this morning, our brother Charlie Capito. We have missed you and we are glad you're back. Would you bow with me in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks for this day and this time of worship. We are reminded always of your grace through Jesus for our lives and our hope. We thank you, Lord, for the service of all those who preach and teach your word that lead us in songs and praise through instruments. It makes our worship to you and each of us much richer. Lord, we are mindful that our world is both beautiful and dark. We pray for the families of those lost in the many shootings and for those who rush to respond to care for them and the survivors. We pray, Father, for peace, for some sanity that such events will stop. We lift to you all of the people in Ukraine and for peace there and in this world. We are thankful, Lord, for this church and its history of service. But Lord, may we continue to answer your call upon us as your people to do kingdom work. We also, Lord, ask that you bless those who are dealing with illness, especially those within our own number, Keith Carwell, Mayetta Hines, Jane Freeman. We continue to remember and lift the families of Jenny Lou Hagen and Margaret Bush in the loss of their loved ones. And Lord, we take a moment now to lift anyone else that is on the hearts of those here. Lord, we are mindful that we are imperfect servants and we ask you, ask that you fill in the gaps for us where we are found lacking. We are grateful for your son and for his grace that saves us and we are reminded to pray together as he taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit go with you all into this new week as you follow that one who gave us all for you. Amen. Amen. Amen.